In this video, we're going to look at Poisson regression. So previously, we primarily have focused on logistic regression, where we have a binary outcome. In this set of nodes, we're going to look at when our outcome is count data. And so count data is often common in op observational as well as epi studies. And it naturally arises from studies investigating the instance of mortality or disease in a population. So any time that you know, your outcome is counts, that's when Poisson regression may be appropriate. And so just as kind of a reminder here, um, we worked with bin the, the binomial distribution, which led to logistic regression. Here we're going to be working with the Poisson distribution for um, Poisson regression. And it ends up we'll find out that the simple Poisson uh, model can be quite limited. But the idea is we want to allow each sampling unit, whether it be a person, a county, um, you could think of a hospital, for example, to have a unique rate parameter, lambda i. And just as a reminder, remember when we work with the Poisson distribution and we look at that rate parameter, for the Poisson distribution, the rate parameter is both the mean and the variance. They're both going to be equal to lambda. And this will become important later on because this is one of the restrictions with the Poisson distribution. And so when we think of in terms of generalized linear models, remember we need our random and our systematic components. And so we have these two right here. And so our random component here, that's going to be that yi is distributed Poisson with lambda i. And then our systematic component, this is where we are going to tie in our explanatory variables with that mean. And so here we have nu i is equal to x transpose beta, same systematic component that we saw with logistic regression and when we talked about generalized linear models in general. And so just as a reminder that the canonical link for the Poisson distribution is the log link. And so we end up with this right here. We have the log of lambda i is equal to nu i and lambda i is equal to e to the nu i. And remember that the nu i, that's really x transpose beta. That's where we're bringing in those explanatory variables. And so just as a reminder here, the canonical link is going to ensure that lambda is going to be greater than zero, and that is one of the restrictions for the Poisson distribution that we have to meet. So let's just start out um, with an example here. And so we're going to look at data that looks at the number of new AIDS cases in Belgium from 1981 to 1993. And here's some R code just on how to read in that data and to make a simple plot. And so if we look at the plot here, Notice that if we think of in terms of observations, here our observations are not, you know, a county or a person or anything like that. Here it's actually going to be in terms of the year. And so we're looking at the number of cases per year. And so our outcome here really is a count. So this is going to be well suited for Poisson regression. Now, one thing just to kind of note here that we're going to gloss over is the year really is our explanatory variable because we're using year to explain, you know, what the different counts are. And so really in practice, we would want to look at techniques for a time series. And the reason for that is, for example, if, you know, 1990, 1988 is high, then we would anticipate the year that follows it probably to be high. So in other words, one year's count is probably correlated. We call this autocorrelation with the year before it. But we're going to ignore that fact for right now and just focus on the fact that the outcome is a count and how we want to handle that using Poisson regression. So just as a reminder, um, exponential growth models are reasonable in the early stages of a pandemic. Um, we actually saw this um, earlier on back in module three and in particular go back and have a look at module 3.1. In module 3.1 we actually you know, talked about this type of model. So we could look at this simple linear model where we have nu i is equal to beta naught plus beta one year i. And then if we combine that with the log link, we're going to get the following exponential growth model where beta naught is equal to log gamma and beta one is equal to um, delta. And so just kind of as a reminder to see what's happening here, we've got that nu i is equal to log lambda i, therefore nu i, if we look at what lambda i is equal to, we have that nu i is also equal to beta naught 
plus beta 1 here i, and then if we take what nu i is equal to, in other words, log lambda i, this also tells us that log lambda i is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 year i. And so therefore we have that log lambda i is equal to, using these pieces right here, log delta, or probably log gamma plus delta year i. And so fitting these models can be accomplished via iterative weighted least squares. And just as a reminder, we saw that previously in module four. And then here's what that reweighting step would look like. And furthermore, we can carry out inference according to that walled approximation. Again, this is exactly what we've seen before. And so just as a reminder here, you know, we've got our statistic or our beta hat here. Um, this can represent a vector of betas. So in this case, we have both a beta naught and a beta one. And we see that that is normally distributed where the mean is equal to the parameter, you know, the betas. And then our um, covariance matrix and our variance estimates come from this piece right here. And this looks very similar to what we saw with linear regression. But remember, we do have that W. Oops, I didn't mean to mark that. I meant to highlight that. We have that W in the center. And so we can then transform the estimates and confidence intervals to get estimates on the lambda scale, basically just like we did with logistic regression when we wanted things on the pi scale. And so we can fit these models in both SAS and R. They are fairly straightforward. You'll see that these look very, very similar to what we did with logistic regression. And so notice here, the big difference is, is the distribution is equal to POI or Poisson for SAS. And then down here, same thing, a family is Poisson for an R. So that's really where you're specifying, you know, are you working with a binomial family, a Poisson family? That's how both of these softwares are understanding the difference between what type of generalized linear model it is that you're trying to fit. And so here's what the R output would look like. Again, the output is going to look very, very similar to what you saw with logistic regression. Notice here, that's where we have our estimates. And similar to what we saw before, you know, it also is going to tell us the number of iterations that were needed in that uh, reweighting process. Just like before with logistic regression, um, we can talk about the difference between likelihood ratio intervals and test versus, you know, the walled method. And so just as a reminder, this was back in module 6.1 that we saw these. So again, just like before, the default style is going to be that walled style interval. But if you remember, um, the walled style interval, one of the issues with it is, it is that for symmetry because it uses that normal approximation, whereas the likelihood uh, method isn't going to force that symmetry. And we've seen as sample size get really large, these are going to be very similar in terms of you know, what we get from both of them. So to obtain likelihood ratio tests and confidence intervals in SAS, you can add options um, like these right here. In R, the confident function also produces likelihood ratio intervals, while likelihood ratio tests can also be carried out by fitting the full model fit and reduce model fit zero. And then the same thing with the test, you can um, do that by submitting ANOVA, where you compare that fit zero to the fit that you're interested in. And so here's what the R code would look like, as well as the output. All right, so here the fitted model, we can summarize this here in the table. And so we first notice here that we have um, those estimates. And if we look back, this is the same as what we saw on page three here. But what does the intercept mean in this case? So the intercept tells us that the expected log lambda i is equal to negative 397.06 at year zero, or that the expected count is the following at year zero. But this isn't particularly meaningful. I mean, if we go back up to our scatter plot of the data, you know, our data starts here um, at the year uh, 1981, 
And so, you know, that's not exactly meaningful. So one thing that you could do is you could recenter it so it begins at the start of the study, 1981. So in other words, in your actual data set, take all of your data, or pardon, all of your explanatory variables, your year, and you just recenter it so that 1981 is actually zero. In other words, subtract 1981 off of all of the explanatory variable values. And so notice if we do that, these are our new estimates. And now when we go to interpret our intercept, our intercept is going to be interpreted as starting in 1981, which, which does have meaning. And so this is one of the things when you're thinking about whether or not to center a variable, you know, these are one of the considerations to take, in, take into account. It's not always just you know, does centering help us maybe, or centering, or any kind of transformation you make, does that transformation help us in terms of, you know, our diagnostics and our model fit, but we can also think of transformations as a way to help us with our interpretations. And so this is a good example where a very simple transformation, you know, helps us interpret our different parameter values. And notice, you know, the only parameter estimate that changes is the estimate of the intercept, um, the effective year, the estimate for it does not change. And so, and that's because all we're doing is recentering um, that explanatory variable year. All right, so next, if we look at the interpretation of the coefficient for year, we get the following. The coefficient for year tells us the expected change in log lambda is 0.2 for each additional year. Um, but again, just like with logistic regression, you know, if we just look at the estimate that we get in R, they, they typically aren't the most meaningful. In this case, it's because it's on the log lambda scale. So usually what we're going to do is some kind of transformation after we get those estimates. And again, we do this for the sake of interpretation. So what we end up using with Poisson regression is we actually work with what are called rate ratios. So if we consider two hypothetical observations with different explanatory variable values, so let's say x1 and x2, so for our example we were just looking at this would be a difference in years, the Poisson GLM with log link implies the following. So if we look at the ratio of lambda 2 to lambda 1, and so notice this is a ratio of rates because lambda is the rate parameter, this is going to be equal to if we think of the two different nu's from those models, e to the nu 1 divided by e to the nu 2, and then remembering what nu 1 and nu 2 actually represent, that x transpose beta, we end up with the following. So we have that this is equal to e to the x2 minus x1 transpose beta. So in other words, what we're saying here is if a variable j changes by amount delta j, then that rate ratio between those two rate parameters for the lambda is going to be equal to e to the delta j beta j. And so rate ratios are a common way of describing the coefficients of a Poisson regression model. And what it does is it puts them on a scale that is more interpretable, analogous with the use of odds ratios and logistic regression. So you should see now that kind of the pattern of how we handle logistic regression is very, very similar to how we handle Poisson regression. But really the differences that we have go back to this idea of what our underlying distribution is. So in this case, you know, our underlying distribution is the Poisson distribution. So that distribution is really what's driving um, the difference in our canonical link. It's also what's driving, at the end, how we end up interpreting these parameters. You know, here, instead of looking at odds ratios, we're going to look at rate ratios, because when we talk about the parameters for Poisson distribution, we're really talking about rates. And so we can see, again, the overall structure between the logistic regression and the Poisson regression, very, very similar to one another. But we do have to make changes that account for these different underlying distributions. And again, the choice of those distributions is really driven by what our outcome variable is, you know, and again with Poisson regression it is counts. So in terms of the Belgian AIDS example, um, we have the following. So our regression coefficient of 0.2 implies that the rate ratio is equal to e to the 0.2 or 1.2. So in other words, the number of AIDS cases in Belgium increased by 20% each year over the time span from 81 to 93. 
Another way of putting that is you could look at e to the 5 times 0 0.2, which is equal to 2.7. So in other words, the number of AIDS cases increased by 170% every five years. Or another way to put it, instead of looking at delta 5, we could look at delta equal to 3.5, and so the number of AIDS cases doubled every 3.5 years. And so you might say, okay, well, which one is, is the best interpretation? And this really is going to be up to you. So if we look at this third one, for example, you, the question might be, how often do the cases double? Okay, and so really here, you know, you start with the two, and the idea is, well, what is this delta? And so you have the 3.5 is what, you know, when it doubles. Um, in another one, you know, that first one, we're looking at a single year increase. Oftentimes, we don't look at a single year. We might look at five years or every 10 years what is happening. And so here, the interpretation, let me mark that out again, um, is driven by that choice of delta. So any of these that you choose are very reasonable. You probably wouldn't want to choose all of these, you know, in a report, but they all have, you know, reasonable choices have been made into which one um, is reported. So whether it being, well, how many years before we see a doubling or what's ever happening every five years, again, you could do every 10 years. It would just depend on the specific case that you were looking at as to which one may be the most appropriate. And maybe there, there's more than one that's an appropriate way to interpret it. And so we can visualize the comparison of the linear predictors, the response, and the number of cases by looking at the plots that we have here on the next page. And so here, notice in the plot on the left, we're looking at the linear predictor. Here, we're actually looking at the number of cases. And so ideally, you know, in the linear predictor, we expect to see it to be linear. And then in the cases, that's when it's transformed and we're actually looking um, at the number of cases. So just like with logistic regression, there are two commonly used types of residuals for the Poisson regression. Um, they're the Pearson residuals and the deviance residuals. And so now we're really going to start talking about those model diagnostics. And what you're going to see is um, these are very, very similar to what we had in logistic regression. And I'm actually going to skip over some of these in the video and just have you look at them in the notes yourself because they are so similar to the idea of logistic regression. Okay, so starting out with these residuals, uh, again, we've got the Pearson residuals here. They are pretty straightforward. So if we look here at the RIs, really notice what we've got here. We've got our YIs minus lambda hat i divided by the square root of lambda hat i. And you might say, well, why are we dividing by lambda hat i in the denominator? Well, remember, for most of these Pearson residuals, you know, really what you're looking at is in the numerator, you're, divide, you're you know, subtracting off the estimate and then denominator dividing by, you know, your standard error or some type of variance. Well, remember that before the Poisson, the mean and the variance are both lambda. And so that's why you're seeing it here. But the overall structure it's pretty much just like you saw, you know, before when we looked at RI. And so note here that we call YI the observed quantity and lambda hat the expected quantity. And so you really, you end up with a chi-squared statistic that, you know, you've probably seen before. You've got your observed minus your expected divided by your expected. And then before we talked about deviance residuals, um, so the one change here is we do need to make a slight modification to our definition of deviance. And so previously when we looked at logistic regression, we had taken it to mean negative two times L, but there is a broader definition here, which is two times L max minus L, where L max is the maximum possible log likelihood for the observed data, given the distribution specified by the model. So here the deviance may be interpreted as the gap between the model's fit to the data and the fit of an ideal model for which lambda hat is equal to y for all observations. And so it ended up, it can be shown that this detail, it wasn't really relevant for our previous uses of deviance when we work with uh, binomial and normal distributions. And the reason for that is it can be shown that L max is equal to zero but it ends up that this is not the case for Poisson distribution. So this is just something to keep in mind. I mean, you're never going to be calculating deviance, you know, by hand, but it is kind of just a fact that it is important to know that when we calculate the deviance for the Poisson, it is slightly different because we have that term is no longer zero. And so it ends up with the Poisson. This is what you'll end up having for the DIs. 
And so one advantage of this new definition of deviance is it allows all these y hat factorial terms to cancel out. And so you end up with the following. Right. And so then, of course, we've also got the concept of leverage that we've seen one before. Leave out diagnostics, distance, delta beta are the same as they were for logistic regression. And so recall once again that both types of residuals can be standardized by dividing by the square root of 1 minus HAI. And again, that's the exact same that we saw with logistic regression. All right, so we can now turn to that Belgian AIDS data example and this is where I'm going to have you read the next several pages on your own and so you'll notice we'll start out here you'll read about deviance you'll look at the Cook's D you're going to look at the a, um, probably the Delta betas as well as the residuals for um, that particular model and what you're going to see as you read through there how you check one of those is almost identical to what you checked for logistic regression so it looks very very similar and what you'll see is that for each of those, it does suggest that there's a problem with the model fit. And so then after you read those, you know, pause this video, read those and come back. And so you'll see that there's a problem with the model fit. And so, you know, usually if there's a problem with the model fit, we may want to try something else. And so it ends up, since we have this indication that we have a poor model fit, um, what we might want to do is actually look at fitting a quadratic model. And so we're going to look at what that looks like. So how effective is our model at predicting the outcome? So as with logistic regression, uh, two measures that are commonly used are reduction in squared error and deviance explained. So again, same thing as logistic regression. And so once again, both measures can be adjusted for the number of parameters by dividing by the number n minus p, or probably the numerator by n minus p, and the denominator by n minus 1. And so we end up with the following for the Belgian AIDS example. And so notice here is where we're really going to compare that linear model with the quadratic. And so here to here. And notice that AI, oh, probably notice that each of these are going to favor that quadratic model. And it also ends up that if you look at the AIC, AIC is also going to strongly favor that quadratic model. And so here's what the R code would look like to fit that and make those comparisons. And then here we have those diagnostic plots. So this is similar to before where we looked at the number of cases versus the linear predictor. And so notice now our linear predictor um, is going to be more curved. And then just like before, here we have the Cook's D we have the delta beta plots and the residuals. And so I'll have you look at each of those on your own, but you should see that for each of them, you're gonna see a pretty big improvement in each of the plots by um, including that quadratic, um, um, pardon me, by including that quadratic term into the model. And so what you've seen here is very similar to what we've seen before. You know, typically we fit that very simplistic model. We look at the diagnostics and then we say, okay, well, do we need to add anything to change anything to that model? Again, very similar to examples that you've seen in the past.